Welcome to the dance years and the year 2001 and the last program in the series. As we're only halfway through the year, I've picked my top 10 tunes so far and we're kicking off with this one. It's the return of the Jacks. Yep, those talented Brixton boys, Basement Jacks, are back with this smash hit Romeo featuring the lovely vocals of Kenny LaRock. It's the first single off their new album for 2001, Rooty, and it's my choice for number 10. Initially, it was from a male perspective. I used to be your Romeo, I used to be special, you know, it was also perfect and romantic, which, you know, often happens in relationships. You have this kind of idyllic honeymoon kind of time, and then it kind of all falls to pieces, and, um, and then it's just letting it all go and moving on. But you still have a bit of that relationship always with you. on a radio program and I think it was a panel kind of judging records and one of them was Basement Jacks and she said she loved Basement Jacks and, um, and she'd like to work with us. So we gave her a call and said, you know, come into the studio, tried a few tracks and Romeo seemed to work really well. I think Romeo is, uh, it's an R&B song disguised as a house track. It could be it, it could be a, an Eve or a Destiny's Child song, actually, it's, which I find kind of humorous. The fact that the Jacks have taken that influence of R&B and put it straight onto what they do in house music, just twisted a bit. So it is a pop song, but it's an R&B pop song, and it and it really is clever in that aspect. I think I like that the most about it. The biggest music scenes of the last few years has been the new school, old school revival. New school is, well, new school breaks. The, the breaks is the word left off there. New school breaks is actually breakbeat and electro, modern, uh, with, a, with a sort of a, a more techno kind of attitude to it. That is it's funky, it's got that edge, it's got the, the whole breakbeat thing of big beat, but it's much more cool, much more underground and edgy. Uh, like all scenes that have been around for a long time, everybody likes to look backwards and the emergence of this new school, old school sound is obviously a way that people are sort of trying to regenerate the feelings that were about back in 1988. I'm forever getting people coming up to me like going, yeah, you're from the old school. And I'm like, well, what do you call the old school? If you mean the 87, 88 Summer of Love, 89 Madness, then yes, that's me. I'm from the old school. But if you're talking about the real old school, it goes back 10 years before that, 78, 79, 80, 81. That's the real old school. So it can be used, it's a term that can be used in many different ways. A lot of old school promoters like myself are sort of interested in, to a certain extent, going back to basics, where we, where we evolved from in the first place, and trying to generate a sound from that environment and 
you'll find that a lot of the old school people are more interested in the more musical thing, the more deeper sound. When you listen to old school, you hear all the elements that are in it. You hear you hear the piano-y sounds, that, the happy piano-y sounds that happy hardcore has. You hear the break beats and the dark bass line that Jungle has. You hear the kind of skippy kind of beats that Two Step Garage has. And basically it all stems from that, so it's the original, it's the original sound. Kashin get my number nine spot with one of the biggest drum and bass tunes of the year so far. This is Slip and Slide Suicide. Kashin's Slip and Slide um, Shuishide was a choice of record of the week. The second that I heard it on Radio 1, just because I was surprised it was being played during the day. And it just sounds so different to the rest of the playlist, because it has got that little, you know, the little darker undercurrent. Um, and, it, you know, it does sort of nudge towards drum and bass just about as much as you're going to get on Radio 1 during the day. So when I heard that, I went, ears pricked up. So, Doo -doo 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 -doo. what is that? I want that. What is it? Why aren't I playing that? Um, so I actually texted Chris Moyles, who was on air at the time, going, what is this song? And then went in and kicked my legs and demanded that I have it as record of the week, and he gave it to me. Just because uh, I think it's good just to bring that a little darker element. You know, even though it's in the morning, I think people can listen to something like Slip and Slide easier than something like Doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, that sort of nonsense. Um, so I like it just because it's got a little bit of a grind to it. I've seen them come through in about um, the last year or so and uh, what I like about them, it's not just reliant on computers because they're into drum and bass, they actually very much want to sort of push their instruments as well. Uh, they play guitar on stage, they, they've, I've yet to see them live, this is what I've heard, but they're very much a fusion of sort of the computer with the live music. It's got a rawness to it, drum and bass used to have, and Kashin have got that rawness. They've kept that element right in there, and it's brilliant to hear that on radio again and to play it. She's one of the most outspoken DJs on the dance scene, generating music and controversy in equal measure. It can only be DJ rap. I used to travel and I used to sing songs in clubs to like pay for my flat and rents and all that stuff. Really cheesy songs like Sam Fox and Madonna and uh, stuff like that. But you know, hey, it was better than picking bananas. So I did that. And um, I thought, right, come back to England now. I'll get a skill whilst I'm on the road to fame, whatever. So I thought, I'll train to be a lawyer. So I did that for a while. And then I met these two nutty girls who were like, you've got to come check these raves out. They're wicked, you know, acid house party. And I ended up squatting, basically, with these girls, jacked in the job, jacked in everything, got into the rave scene. And uh, that's how I was introduced to it, really. I got signed to um, Paul Logan Fold's label under a different name doing house music and uh, I just released a record called Ambience, The Adored and uh, the, the record went straight into the national charts, did really well and I got completely ripped off and uh, the guy I wrote it with also sort of said that I had nothing to do with it which was really nice of him. But look where he is now. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> that was that really and 
you know what I mean? I sort of lost heart after that. I was, I was so kind of heartbroken. So that sort of made me think, well, I'm not going to do that again for a little while until I've learned how to produce and engineer myself so I don't have to rely on any, anybody else ripping me off, really. And so I was at this rave, and I remember I was watching these two DJs called Dem2, and I was having such an amazing time. It was like this little light bulb just went off, and I was like, oh, you know what, that looks like so much fun. i really got to have a go at this. And it was literally all in one of those spiritual, religious moments you have. And I remember then thinking, right, go home, one old Syntronic deck, one tape deck, and that's how I practiced for hours, trying to mix this crap Syntronic deck into my tape deck. So that's really how it started, sing a first with a band and perform songs. And the DJing was my avenue and doorway and, and stepping stones to that. I mean, I couldn't have wished for a more cooler way to do it. I mean, you know, I don't have to worry about ever being cheesy or anything because I've certainly proved myself in the underground and continue to do so. One of the biggest New York DJs, Roger Sanchez, is a man responsible for my number eight tune. He says he's taken his time to release a single of his own because he wanted to get it right. And he certainly has with his tune. Here's another chance. <laughs> and Rui De Silva. And get the lowdown on the high-tech decks that today's DJs are using. Welcome back to the dance years. In a minute, we'll hear from Rui De Silva. But first, here's my number seven. Eddie Grant first had a top ten hit with Electric Avenue back in 1983. This year, it got the remix treatment and hit the top ten for a second time. Expect another Eddie Grant remix this year, as well as loads of other 80s classics. I liked it for about two weeks, and it's now it's panting it. It was it was it was it was it was fun for two weeks, but it's like you know, I, I remember coming up the escalators at uh, Bond Street tube station, and uh, Chris Tarrant was playing it at eight o'clock in the morning. I thought it's all over. I can't play that again. Now in the street there is violence. Grant, Electric Avenue. I remember that the first time round, you know. I've said it before, I'll say it again, acid granddad, you know what I mean? I'm no spring chicken anymore, I can tell you. Um, what a wicked tune, I remember loving that when it first came out. And um, there's been a couple of times I've heard that actually in rave scenarios where people have dropped it, like, and they've not been frightened to drop it. And it's been like, oh yeah, we're gonna rock down to Electric Avenue. I think it's great. And I know it's just been re-released, hasn't it? I saw it on TV the other day. And uh, I'm not so keen on the new version, but what a tune. And it's good to see that it has come back round, especially for Eddie Grant. I mean, he hasn't done anything for a whole 10, 15 years. He must be over the moon. Eddie Grant's Electric Avenue has proved so popular because it's extremely catchy and people recognise it from before. It's the worst side of electronic dance culture, is you can just reproduce something and regurgitate it with different, you know, different beats underneath. And uh, you know, people are uh, dumb enough to go for it, unfortunately. We don't just dance differently these days, we listen differently as well. Music technology has come a long way over the last decade, and there's far more to come. I've been DJing for about 10 years now, so I'm always on the lookout for new toys to play with. And a friend of mine, Keith Riley, was building fabric at the time. I came up with the idea, told Keith, and 
He liked it enough to say, go and build me one, Ben, if you can do it, and uh, we did. A normal speaker system has a magnet with a paper cone, where the magnet is a driver unit, and the paper cone hits the air and makes sound waves. With hundreds of these strapped underneath the dance floor, what happens is the dance floor becomes a massive driver unit. And when you're standing on it, the vibrations enter your feet and then up through your skeleton, and your skeleton actually vibrates out. It's kind of like standing in front of a bass speaker at a club, but instead of having the sound hitting you in the chest and moving inwards, you can feel the bass come from the inside of you out. We've got two basic types of transducers, even though there are four in our range, depending on the application and the power required. These ones here just do bass frequencies, the lower the kick drum, your bass lines. And this is a new one that we've just developed, which does full range. What we do with these is we attach them to various surfaces. You can do it with glass, metal, wood. And it turns the, the surface of the material into a speaker. So I'll demonstrate. You can hear a little bit of sound spillage from it. When you put, when you put it on here, you can hear it actually turning this box into a speaker. Now obviously it's not particularly loud because we've only got one of them that you do this on a mass scale. But what that means is we can turn an entire club into a sound system. The great thing about using MP3s for DJ is obviously the amount you can take with you. I've got four and a half thousand on this like, bit of kit here and it's growing probably about 100, 150 a week. I'm getting new ones off the web and stuff. So you don't need to sort your records out, you just take the whole lot with you. All you need, a computer, a monitor, normal mixer, same you would anywhere else. And this is the magic little thing. The interface, this basically acts as an interface between the computer and the mixer. You move through the tracks you want like that, selected. You notice I've got all the categories there, from house to R&B to comedy to funk. Press that button there, loads that track in. Press that button there, plays it. You can vary speed it the same as you would a CD player or a deck. You know, you can slow it down, pitch bend like that. You know, fast forward. Finish. This button here is great because you can load another track into the other player uh, and then you can press the equals button and it's now made both of those tracks the same tempo. So when you start this one, it's going to start exactly the same beats per minute as the other one. When you do get the two in, they stay together because it's like perfect digital time. I'm, I'm all for it. This next tune was massive in Miami earlier this year. Hailing from France, here's Bella Moore. record that's sitting in our box at the moment and they've just remixed this time around and like we were saying earlier it's fantastic brilliant tune um sort of keeps you hanging on into then when that bass line kicks in yeah it's got um, a very nice long intro yeah and then the bass screams, not really good screaming track. bass line wicked yeah thumping <laughs> With a lot of these French records, you just kind of, they seem to go in the studio and press the button marked French and it just sort of pops out, you know? And they've got such a distinctive sound to them. But, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's good fun stuff. by Bella Moore is um, it's another one of those French records that just appear in the record shop. I remember I've been playing it since last year actually. 
Um, it's been around a little while and it's kind of got this real long filtered intro and then this, this guy's vocal coming. I actually prefer the instrumental when they're kind of writing in the studio. They don't speak English as their first language. So it's like, oh, that sounds good. Let's put it in. And when we hear it, we're like, oh, kind of, so, you know, it's borderline almost, but, you know, it's cool. Um, I think that's going to be a big summer record, big Ibiza record. From early raves to two-step and jungle, the dance years have changed the face of UK music. But what will be the next big thing? I think, to be honest, the big records again will be the the deeper disco-based stuff, you know, your groove jets, your, your mojos, those, those sort of things. I still think that French sound is really massive. In the future, it's going to be like a mixture of hip-hop and drum and bass, you know what I'm saying? It's like, like I said, they go hand in hand. They influence each other, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I would love to see like a hip hop drum and bass album come out, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, they're both rugged, they're both raw, they're both street music, and that's what it's about. There's a lot of people uh, getting back into drum and bass, and it, it, it's great. There's a lot more feeling coming back into the music, which is really, really good. And there's a lot of new artists coming out, which is the most important thing. I think maybe a lot of the big drum and bass artists are sitting on their laurels a little bit and driving around their cars and posing a bit too much. And uh, it's great because we've got a whole new school coming through. One of the biggest records that came out of Miami this year was uh, uh, a bootleg version of Eddie Grant's Electric Avenue, which is just sort of following on from the whole sort of sun is shining phenomenon, where you, you're taking old records, putting a kind of house beat under it and getting a hit or kleptomania, it's all I do, doing it with Stevie Wonder. And it's good fun, it's silly, it's stupid but fun. And I think that there's gonna be quite a lot more of that going on as well. Everything is becoming more song-based, which is brilliant because without a good song, you don't really have anything. Drum and bass is becoming slightly more musical. Uh, Two-step is becoming even slightly acoustic, dare I say, which is fantastic. I mean, basically everything is homogenizing. There's a massive difference between the way that A&R men will hear records and the way that DJs will hear records, and they are not hearing it in terms of what will necessarily stir the emotions of the dance floor. They will be hitting it from the perspective of thinking, well, we can sell shed loads of these things. So, I mean, there's a purist perspective and there's a commercial perspective. At number five is a real street bread garage anthem. Do you really like it? From the Southwest London Five, some DJ Pied Piper and the Masters of Ceremonies. And the public obviously did like it because it went straight in to number one. For those sick of glammed up fashion, there was a looser hanging alternative. Started in 1889, um, travelling salesman. Um, wanted to manufacture clothes for the working masses in America and he basically started around about probably the same time, the same idea what Levi's was doing. It was the, the dungarees, the overalls, um, out of the, the hardware and material at the time, which people actually used for tents. It was actually a mixture of canvas and denim, which had this reputation for just being completely indestructible. Um, and, you know, to cut a long story short, it was kind of, I think, that where the street side of it, more from the hip-hop angle, picked up on it as maybe like an anti-fashion because it wasn't a fashion brand. It never was a fashion brand. A lot of brands work through advertising. We were just like, we're going to work with some small DJs, work with some smaller, you know, up-and-coming artists at the time. And we, it was about 95, 96, we started, you know, sponsoring like Ronnie Size and Ninja Tune and people like that. It just blew up. People have stopped wearing Western jeans. I mean, the whole Levi's thing, the whole five pocket jeans thing had completely changed and people were getting used to the looser fit, which was the combat pan and obviously was the Carhartt work pan. And then, you know, within five minutes, everyone was doing a work pan. Every single brand under the sun was doing a work pan. And it got kind of marketed into like a kind of, I don't know if you want to call it urban look. When the Carhartt Americans come over here, they don't understand that they've got a shop on Neil Street in a very fashionable area. They, I think they just see money. <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand how, in, in America, it's just sold in 
a very basic day's workwear and they can't sort of see the relevance of something costing 20 bucks in the States and 50 pounds over here. It's just a different market, you know, and obviously we're used to ma marketing things to a certain market where in America it's available to the masses. My choice for number four is I Want to Be You by Dutch producer Chocolate Puma, which actually reached number six in the charts earlier this year. Let's check it out. It is our record of the week. Um, just because the first time I played it, I listened to the start and I was thinking, oh, here we go again. And it ain't anything like that. Then played it in and it just, uh, just really funky, happy, simple. Uh, you know, there's no hidden message in there. And um, it's just a nice little sort of poppy dancing. Um, but uh, but liked it as well, yeah, it's got a little bit of stomping in it with the vocals. I like that. this record um, because it's got an old school sound to it, an old school house sound. It's quite deep um, and it's very funky um, and I like music that takes a note from the past because it always seems to work well. You always go back to go forwards and I think Chocolate Puma have shown that. <laughs> Big club track. It's kind of different as well with the, the way his vocals worked on top of the groove, where they were just copying exactly what the music was doing, like melody-wise and stuff, which was pretty cool. And big breakdown, which always works in the clubs. So yeah, I think they've had a, a big hit with that. That's it for part two. Join me after the break when we've got an exclusive interview with Pete Tong and we'll be finding out what's my number one tune of the year so far. Welcome back to the Dance Years and 2001. In a minute we'll be hearing from Pete Tong, but first let's find out what's my number three tune of the year so far. M&S have been behind some excellent tracks over the years. They teamed up with The Girl Next Door to produce this top 10 smash, sampling an old South Soul tune, exactly named South Soul Nugget. And I defy you not to get up and dance to this one. Well, we were in the studio and um, just listening to some records and um, all of a sudden uh, Ricky put um, double exposure on the turntable and uh, we sat back, kicked back, ready to listen to the tune and then all of a sudden we jumped up and uh, Ricky's gone, oh my god, and that was it, you know, straight into the sampler and uh, it was effortless really, wasn't it? The whole thing was... Uh, a vibe, you know, so it's fantastic. I 
I played it in um, Switzerland. Like Switzerland, yeah. And um, got the acetate in the evening to fly out there. And I just thought, well, I might as well play it like, while I'm here, you know, just played it. The DJ, a guy called Mr. Mike, the first DJ to play the record, um, he. Uh, I played the record and he just lost his mind. He goes, what the hell is this Rick? I need this tune. You can't leave the club until I have this tune. So I had to give him my acetate. And from then on, went back to the studio and told you friend. Found me, didn't yeah. you? you found me from Switzerland. He's gone, you're not going to believe this. I'm so sick of not. He's gone, the record, it went, you know, the club went absolutely mad. <laughs> The record itself is fantastic. It evokes that uh, South Soul, Philly disco feel of uh, you know Studio 54. It has everything in it, and it's very refreshing to see a record like that go top 20. Well done, lads. <laughs> As Radio 1 discovered dance in the 90s, one man was at the forefront of the scene. Presenter, producer and DJ. It's all gone a bit Pete Tong. The whole thing for me is about discovering new sort of genres and forms of dance music. So I was always excited by change and that, that really set me apart to a certain extent from the rest of the sort of soul mafia crowd in the um, early and mid 80s. And hip hop was the first time I sort of felt like I'd had an affair <laughs> with another woman outside of the soul camp. But then um, towards the end of 86, early 87, when the first sort of house records started coming through, that was like, that was the, the next sort of affair. <laughs> and that was, there was no going back after that one. He keeps pushing underground music through his show. He, he keeps his one foot in the underground and one foot in, the, in kind of the commercial ground. And I think for a DJ and for an artist to do that, I mean, it's got to be respected. You can't take it away from Pete. And I think a lot of people don't really appreciate or understand what, where he really comes from. There's a baggage that comes with being that well known, which is you're just assumed to be this person or that person. And I'm quite often not what people think I am. Or, and I just constantly want to do different things. So um, I'm, I'm probably more particular than ever about where I play now. I probably spend more time convincing people to let me play funny enough. Thank God there's someone on Radio 1 playing this sort of music. And I, I think like um, in the underground scene, Pete Tong is, is, is not been looked at in the way that he should have. And uh, in the more commercial scene, he has actually got the props that he deserves. And I think the underground kids ought to wise up because if it wasn't for people like Pete Tong, they'd still be listening to ACDC. So I don't actually think what I play on the radio is that different to what I play out, but um, I understand why other people might, because they might not listen to Radio 1, so, and they just might think that Radio 1 must mean that it's all sort of lowest common denominator. But I think Radio 1 still, you know, it's a great station. It's one of the only stations in the world where you can be that experimental without some advertiser breathing down your neck. So it's, you know, it's, it's still the greatest platform, and I think people are a bit short-sighted to think that, you know. Pete Tong is a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, to be quite honest, um, I, I have to big him up because when we did the, the, the Black Legend tune originally, he was hammering it hard. Um, so yeah, man props. DJ producer Joey Negro scored a number one on the UK charts with American Dream, which sampled the soundtrack from the film American Beauty. He's just missed my top spot. He's made my number two choice of the year so far.
when I heard the opening music in American Beauty, I liked it, but I also thought that actually sounds quite dancey in a weird sort of like sort of ethnic sounding way. So I really liked the film and I bought the uh, bought the CD. And I was just listening to it around the house quite a lot and I thought I must do something with that. I'm sure that would work in a dance context. And I thought it would just be an unusual thing to do rather than the normal sort of like way of going about making a record and normal thing, sort of uh, places look, people look to sample things from. I got this girl's Swahili Nectar to sing on it. I didn't want to put a full song on it, but I thought I want something that sort of fits in with the, you know, the, the backing track. We sounded quite Eastern and sort of ethnic. So she'd done, done stuff with people like Nitin Swarney and Talvin Singh, and I thought, well, she'd fit, you know, to me that would fit more than, you know, putting a sort of spiller or mojo type vocal on it, which I thought, well, to me, I can't, couldn't see that working particularly. So uh, I did that, and uh, I think really, I mean, to be honest with you, I think it was Pete Tong played it a lot. And I think once he started playing it, then a lot of other people all of a sudden started phoning up for it, and a lot, got a lot of record company interest, and uh, basically it was just plain sailing from there. American Dream, everyone knows it as a theme from uh, American Beauty, but it's just actually a piano riff from a jazz record. And uh, Dave Lee, also known as Joey Negro, just does his wonderful, you know, modern day pumping disco backing. Just a great, great song. As we sign off on our history of dance music, what does the long term future hold? It's very difficult to say how one detects what the next big thing might be, but sometimes things just have a, an air of cool about them, a je ne sais quoi. And also, if you can combine that with the uh, desire to be popular, rather than just be an obscurist in the corner doing your own thing and saying, well, hell, I don't care what everyone thinks, then that's a, that, that, that is where you go, hmm, and that looks interesting. Yeah, I could never say that UK garage and all that kind of thing would have been a thing, you know, it just kind of developed somewhere on the side where you weren't looking or, you know, the same with, you know, a lot of the drum and bass stuff, it's sort of like, it was going on for years and bubbling away and then suddenly it looms, you know, it's like, I like the organic nature of the fact that dance music can, can be like that. British culture explodes every 13 years and has done 1950, Teddy Boy, 1963, Mersey Beat and the Beatles and Pop, 1976, Punk, 1989, Acid House, 2002, wait for it, I suppose. It's not a theory, it's just a fact of life and, um, you know, the last one was fantastic. I think the next generation of pioneers will not be coming from the music scene or the club scene. I think they'll be coming elsewhere. Um, and I think it will come from either short films, computer games, um, animation, even sports. I just can't, I can't see it at the moment coming from uh, where we came from. I've got a 12 year old daughter and uh, you know, it's very difficult for teenagers to actually stand out and, and have an identity of their own now. You know, where their parents are so much more culturally aware than they ever have been. And uh, they are looking to react against what, to be honest, has become a, um, a cosy cartel of old men. You know, at the end of the day, you know, there will be another explosion of youthful inspired energy. The great thing about the music industry, it isn't about bloody stars in the end, and it isn't about lawyers and it isn't about marketing and it isn't about top of the pops it's actually about great songs and great pieces of music with great melody lines and great rhythms that get to people and it's still the same and that's whatever bullshit happens you cannot avoid that and the dance years have given us some wonderful wonderful tunes and wonderful pieces of music well, that's it for 2001. I hope you've enjoyed reminiscing to the classic tunes I've been playing you over this series. The Ibiza season is just starting to kick in, so there's going to be loads more big dance tunes across the summer. But for now, I've got one more classic. Classic.